Uh, Eduardo is a strategic partnership manager at Mapillary. He works with both organizations and individuals uh, in the community to help them solve their mapping challenges with street level imagery and derived data. He is here to talk about the varied mapping practices across Asia and walk us through a visual exploration of mapping challenges. All right, can you guys hear me all right? Excellent. All right, first of all, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Wado, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Mapillary. We're going to be going through the region of Asia. I have my colleague Muthu in the audience, yep, up the back. And so, just a heads up, there's going to be some random slides today that are going to prompt you. It's going to be somewhere in Asia, and I'm going to get you to guess where it is. If you get it correct, we have some swag for you. Might be a bit tricky, but we'll see how good your, your knowledge of the region is. So speaking of the region, Asia is a very nebulous concept. It's this huge geographic area. It's, it's kind of been around for a long time. And I, I guess us as humans, we create these groupings to help us better understand concepts, to move our knowledge forward in a particular area. And Asia is one of those. But it's been around long before mapping. It actually, I looked into it and it's, it, they, they reckon it was back in the Greek and ancient Roman times where Asia was just everything else. It was everything east of the Urals. It was the other. And so I thought that was interesting because you look at Asia today and it spans all the way from Turkey to Japan and you could argue that Japan has more in common with the United States than, than Turkey. So it is an incredibly diverse region, but uh, I, I think it's important for us to understand that, to understand the different challenges that we have in the region and I'll be looking at how they apply to Mapillary specifically. But I think we also have, that, that can also be a good thing that we have this diversity in the region at a conference like this. And there's so many people with, with different experiences. So we're going to talk about that today. But before we do, what is Mapillary for those that maybe don't know? We are a platform for street level imagery. But more importantly, it's about how that street level imagery can be used to create map data. So I'm happy to say that we just passed 400 million images. That was actually something that happened, I think, in the last 48 hours. So a round of applause to everyone who's been contributing over the last few years. <laughs> and that means 6 million kilometers and most importantly, 33 billion map objects that have been detected in images around the world. So one of the ways I think it adds value by collecting street level imagery, or in fact, there's two ways. And the first way is um, I think we're unique in that we're a collaborative platform. So much the same way the strength of OpenStreetMap comes from its diversity, the fact that anyone contribute, can contribute. It's the same approach with Mapillary. So by having a device agnostic approach, whereby it doesn't matter which device you have, you can contribute. And by having both individuals and large corporations and everything in between contributing, we can scale up coverage faster and we can get to regions that might otherwise get ignored. So we have devices like all the way from $50 Android smartphones that are contributing to the platform through to these professional rigs that you see here on the other end, which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. The second aspect is computer vision. So I'm going to show you a quick video that details some of, uh, or gives you a, an illustration of what's going on behind every image that's uploaded. So when you hear the term semantic segmentation, maybe some of you have heard it, but it's basically um, how do you classify each pixel? So working out what pixels relate to, so whether it's a tree, whether it's a car, whether it's the crosswalk, and you can get deeper and deeper and, and better at having more classes, classes of, of objects that you identify. So that's what you're seeing here, and that's done by our team in Austria, which uh, is our research team, our computer vision team, looking at lanes, And then here you see point clouds. And point clouds help us work out where an image has been taken, so in relation to one another, so then we can kind of step through the images. But it also allows us to reconstruct the world um, and then understand what those objects are. And so if you look here, you'll see things like traf uh, trash cans detected. You've got um, street lights detected, traffic lights. So it, it gives you a much better understanding of the world around you. Right, bam, this is a question time. Where in the world is this? Where in Asia is this? Swag on offer. If you can get the country, great. If you can get the city, even better. Right up the back, just yell it out, just yell it out. Afghanistan. 
Oh, boom, he's got it. All right. Do you know which city? Got it. Okay, two swag for him, and we'll move on. Get ready for the next one. All right, specifically, how does Map really apply to OpenStreetMap? Well, we've been around in the OpenStreetMap community for a little while now. We started in um, October 2013. And then shortly after that, my colleague Peter, he did the first um, kind of pull request in ID Editor, and he merged in images into ID Editor. And with that in place, you could then go to Stay the Map International in Argentina and talk about it. And that's where like growth really kicked in with the wonderful OpenStreetMap community contributing imagery. And then along the way, like the JOSIM plugin came along. That was another Google Summer of Code project. Traffic signs were integrated, um, which means that OpenStreetMap now had a kind of, a, it could utilize the computer vision that's taking place to work out speed limits and turn restrictions. That was in JOSIM. But now I think one of the exciting things is we're seeing the community use our API and some of our tools to create new new um, new tools. So things like OSM Char, a great example of tools that help us more efficiently edit OpenStreetMap, or in this case, look at edits that were incorrect. <laughs> Pick Vicato and Pick Review are tools that have emerged to kind of um, make it easy to use street level imagery and designed with street level imagery as a primary input. <laughs> so looking at Pick for Review, it was developed by a guy called Adrian Pavi of France. And the cool thing about Adrian is he, he mentioned it to me in August 2017, which was the state of the map in Japan. And you know, during these conferences, you have a lot of com conversations, a lot of cool ideas. He mentioned this, and I thought, oh, that sounds good. He wants to ma make a tasking manager with Mapillary. Whether or not that happens, we'll see. Within, I think it was two months, he'd created the first, first version of it. And if you haven't, check it out. It's a really cool tool where you can um, create a task and, and so it might be, I want to identify, I want you to tell me whether these locations around Marseille and southern France are crosswalks and what kind of accessibility would a wheelchair have. This particular one you see here, the question was, how many lanes does this street have? And then you can go in and quickly click one, two, three, four. You've got a little magnifying glass to look at the image. So it's a really quick way to turn an image into map data. And he uses the look at function in our API to do that. So it's just a cool idea of how our API can be leveraged to create tasking tools. The other quick thing, it's kind of not directly OpenStreetMap, but it's QGIS, so the open source community, um, our brothers and sisters in the, in the FOSPG community. This is an open source plugin developed in Italy by Enrico. And it's kind of, it's still work in progress, but if you're using QGIS and you'd like a street level imagery layer, this is a great way to see images alongside your, your feature sets and shape files in, in QGIS. All right, now so for some of the challenges in our region that, that, um, that I thought were relevant to share at the wider audience. So one is in Laos. This is a, a region where the World Bank has been working alongside the Department of Transport there. And they face a number of challenges. One, Laos is incredibly remote, like you look um, it's, it's landlocked, it's got uh, dense mountains, the Mekong River runs through here with all its tributar tributaries, so it's really hard to get from one place to another. And then on top of that you have things like floods, trees falling over, landslides, the effects of climate. So roads can get damaged and that can shut off entire towns. So the, the purpose of this project was the World Bank wanted to improve the maintenance um, of these roads on a regular basis. Um, so the Department of Transport could quickly respond and fix road issues. So they've been monitoring 2,000 kilometres on a regular basis and even more on a kind of, I think, more in intermittent basis. And they're looking at just the maintenance and supervision of those roads, things like potholes and trees that are falling over or areas that are getting flooded. And so one way they've done this is complete the map. Has anyone contributed to complete the map here? I think one or two. Okay, there's a lot of, lot of uh, fresh blood here that I can recruit, which is good. Uh, so complete the map is just a quick way. It's like a tasking manager, so you can see where your images are, where you still need to contribute. And so this is Laos, a uh, particular province in Laos, and they can see it, that this road is well captured, but they still need to capture these roads. And so it's, it helps them coordinate. The other thing that they're doing is they're tagging. So they're actually noting down in an, in an image. You can do this in Mapillary for all kinds of things. You can say, okay, there's a pothole here, um, or if a tree's fallen over, you can note that there. 
but it, it allows people to quickly um, crowdsource uh, map data that might not necessarily go into OpenStreetMap, so very like temporal stuff. And th we're not using computer vision on this yet, but we do have other uh, things like our verification tool, which is applying crowdsourcing and computer vision. So it's ex I think one thing to see is ex um, where this goes and whether we actually have people drawing little bounding boxes around things that we detect to improve our ability to recall objects. Going with the World Bank again, but this time to uh, Ulaanbaatar and uh, Mongolia, a different approach, same Department of Transport kind of scenario, but they actually got the community involved this time. So previously it was Department of Transport employees in Laos. This one, also Department of Transport employees, but they tried to get the wider community. And I don't know if you've looked at OpenStreetMap in Mongolia or, or Mapillary in Mongolia, but the community is very small, almost non-existent. And so they had to kind of start that from scratch. So one of the things they did was they put a giant billboard in the middle of downtown Ulaanbaatar. It was like a really novel approach to OpenStreetMap in Mapillary, like advertising to the masses. Can you imagine doing that in Bangalore, like paying for a billboard that talks about OpenStreetMap? Um, interesting approach, uh, but th they were pretty successful. They have had a lot of new imagery in Ulaanbaatar. This was just one month. There's even more there now, if you look at it now. But a good example of like trying to be a bit more innovative about how you get people on board quickly to contribute and same sort of approach, they're, they're looking for potholes. They don't have all the climate effects that Laos has to deal with, or the climate um, change issues, but they do have uh, a lot of economic opportunities. It's one of the fastest growing countries in the region, and a lot of that is kind of mining, and so they want to make sure they have roads that support this kind of development. The last example from Asia, Thailand. So. Facebook talked about Thailand. Um, the community there is an interesting one. I think I was speaking to Erwin yesterday, he's in the audience. I think we're agreeing that a lot of it is still expat community. There's, there is a local presence, but there is a big expat community as well. And so you're looking at Chiang Mai here, which is one of the most popular expat places in the world. You know, all the hippies that go for that beautiful um, experience there. And this is one of the, like a, just a screenshot of the map there. And it's, it, there's a lot of POIs that are missing. And so one guy, Johnny Carlson, on his scooter has contributed a lot of imagery, also in his family car. And so what he does, like you go on a family road trip and he'll, uh, you know, with his wife and kids and they'll go out and, and, and see the mountains around and then they'll come back and he'll be like, honey, is it all right? I'm going to take a left here because this road hasn't been covered. And so they go do that. And the next time, honey, can I take a right? And it starts getting longer and longer. And it's like, honey, can I take a 30 minute detour? There's no imagery here. Um, they're still together, which is good. She hasn't broke up with him, but um, <laughs> it's really good for us because he's contributed a lot of imagery in places where we didn't have it previously. And the reason he's doing that is for identifying things like shop fronts, which aren't necessarily discernible from satellite imagery, or almost definitely aren't, and things like health clinics, restaurants, cafes, which are really important for the map to be of any relevance to uh, a backpacker who might be trying to save money, doesn't want to use their data plan, and so uses OSM and, and downloads the map of, uh, of Thailand, of Chiang Mai. Oh, God. Revealing all my secrets. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to share with you is if you really do need a comprehensive coverage in an area, if you have a, a kind of a use case where you need all the roads covered, we, we have started doing that. My colleague Ryan in the US has been coordinating a series of drivers. So in just uh, one week, they covered Hillsborough, Portland. In one month, they uh, covered all of Portland. That was, uh, yeah, so 10 drivers. And they were using our detections of traffic signs, comparing that with their inventory so that we could like work out what we've detected that they didn't have and, and also what we've missed they had. And so improving our algorithms as well. And that's just four, four cameras on top of car. And the drivers are much like people who drive for Uber or, or um, Ola or Grab. They just like the idea of that flexible income that, that driving for Mapillary creates. All right, where is this? Just yell it out, yell it out. Not Vietnam, sorry? Not, not Vietnam. Nope. China's close. 
Taiwan, I think. I think you're correct. Any any idea which city? Not Taipei. Not Taipei. Right, we'll come back to that one later. All right, so this kind of one of the last things I wanted to share with you was our camera grant program. So this is something that we've been doing since uh, since I think 2015, and it started out as like a humanitarian initiative, working with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And they were like, look, we need cameras on the ground in you know, many parts of Africa, Southeast Asia to collect, uh, to collect imagery. But then we saw like a wider use case beyond that. A lot of other people who weren't necessarily in, in humanitarian scenarios also had a need for, for cameras. So we've been expanding that. And now I think we're at a stage where we'd like to ramp it up. And so I just wanted to talk to you about that and how you can take advantage of it. So there's three types of kit available. Um, we're going to create, so we have a dash cam partner. So it's a black view dash cam that you see here. It's a high quality dash cam. And that's good in situations where you don't want a camera on the outside of your car. And it's good it when you're, you're definitely going to have a car and you're driving that same car regularly. You can just keep it there, take the SD card out and upload imagery. We also have uh, a GoPro that we've got a, a kit for for bikes and motorbikes and then a kit for cars. And so what we're doing is um, the idea is people can apply and we try and solve one of three issues. So it might be that your camera, your current camera that you're contributing with is crap and you want better quality imagery. The other one is you might want to increase the capture volume. So you might have, um, you might already have a good camera but it's on the front of your car and you drive a lot and you want to capture the back or the sides as well. So we can help you out with that as well. An additional camera just means more imagery, more data that we can collect. The third one is capture versatility. So if you have a smartphone, maybe it's hard when you ride your bike to capture. So a GoPro with a, a, a bike mount is a good way for you to be able to capture on more modes of transport. Our goal, 100,000 images within six months for, from each camera. So if we, if we start getting, if we're seeing that it's working, we'll just ramp this up and more and more devices will get sent out. So this is kind of what the car kit looks like. You get, a, you get this camera, magnetic mount, it sticks to anything metallic. charger so you can keep going indefinitely until your SD card fills up. So I used this recently in New Zealand. It's very easy. You can see front of the car just sticks on. You've got the, uh, you have the cord going into the car. Um, you might get a few looks from people, but it's a great way to capture imagery um, of, of the area that you're traveling in. And this helped me identify POIs that I actually didn't have time to add manually. Before we, before I let you go, I think it'd be great if we could be like Adrian, who talks about stuff that's the state of the map and then actually does it. So let's drive off sunset, capturing imagery. This car has a GoPro on the front of the back, it captures a lot of Zanzibar. So you guys can take the same approach to the camera grant program. Just don't capture at night though, because we hate that. Last one. Where in the world is this? Some of you were close before. <laughs> Vietnam, it is. I don't know who said that. So <laughs> we'll work out swag distribution later. Um, it's outskirts of Ho Chi Minh City. Were there any questions? Uh, my colleague Muthu is also around. Hey, uh, my main question is like, uh, Every time I use uh, Maplery, the main thing that I uh, come across the problem is that uh, old data between new data. So how do you deal with that? And a uh, second question is that, I mean, uh, following follow-up follow question is that the problem that I had is always that sometimes uh, the old uh, uh, Maplery layer will always be super clear. I would have a uh, new layer, which is in, for example, 2018, but it would be blurred. Because of that, I would end up using 2014. So how do you deal with this old data descriptions that's coming into your platform? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the early days, a lot of places, we didn't have that issue because we didn't have any imagery. So any imagery was good. Um, but now we're seeing a lot of cities where there's just layer upon layer of imagery. So one, probably the easiest way right now is date filters. You can actually filter to look at the date that you're interested in. But that's not something that happens by default. So I think going forward, we're looking at ways in which we can show you the most relevant map, um, the most relevant imagery. But even that can be 
kind of difficult to discern. So we're trying to create automated scores where you can, where, where our algorithms detect what the most useful thing to serve you is. Yeah. I can answer the second part after this. Uh, we can take one question. I guess. Oh. Hi, um, I hadn't heard about Mapillary before. Um, it seems like a fairly fascinating project. It's funny, a friend of mine and I were talking about like doing something like this, and it turns out a company that does this already exists. So yeah, please, please don't compete. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question, which you know, I mean, obviously Google Street Maps has faced the same problem in terms of like I'm sure you guys like you know anonymize faces and like license plates and things like that. But like, what are some other like unexpected like you know privacy related or like you know dealing with like governments? stuff like that, like challenges that like crop up that you maybe didn't expect in the beginning, but like now either, you know, it means that you can't map a certain region or things like that. Yeah, so when it comes to government, so there are some places like uh, roads along the airports and stuff like that, um, which are not uh, allowed to be mapped. So those kind of imagery can still be stored in our platform through privately but it's not uh, available for anyone else to see it. So it's only the users can see it, say um, some city who holds the airport as well or the federal government has the airport. They can see the imagery through our platform and use it for their use cases. But all the uh, public imagery or the public roads can be made available to all the public uh, for use in OpenStreetMap or anything else, but the private data cannot be hosted as well. I don't follow only one question. So uh, just we have started using this uh, Mapillary imagery and it's really cool feature uh, so that we can r see the real time what the thing is that going on. So my question is like, uh, can we have uh, like a high resolution 360 degree imageries where we can see everything but uh, with the less data load? Yeah, that, that all just comes down to the equipment you have. So if I go back. That was uh, the slide with all the different ways you can contribute. So, yeah, that's we have people contributing with things like the Trimble MX7, which is a I think a few hundred thousand dollars, incredibly high resolution imagery. Um, but there's also consumer devices now. So the one you see, the third from the left, this this one that's the LG 360, which is not made anymore, but there's very similar cameras, a um, few hundred dollars, and you get 360 imagery. There's the GoPro Fusion as well, which is like the best in class for consumer 360 now. And we'll wrap it up there. We're yes. around all, all weekends, so come and find us. We'd love to.